<laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. good morning. How is everyone this morning? Good. 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 Just some announcements before we get started this morning. This uh, coming Wednesday night at 7, we'll be on week four. How is it week four already? Mm -hmm. Week four of the Truth Project study. And this week will be called, Is Theology? Who is God? Um, talking about the eternal life according to Jesus and knowing God in an intimate, personal, and relational way. So uh, I invite you all to join us. I know Pastor Mark will be out of town traveling for work, but we will uh, be here and, and uh, going through that study. Today, however, we'll be having our sermon today on uh, anthropology, who is man? And Pastor Mark is bringing us that message this morning. And that will kind of tie everything together that we did on Wednesday night. So look forward to that. Coming up June 11th, which um, is three weeks away, but is like, it'll be here before we know it, is our uh, June races for Orange Track Racing. It's also the family fun day that uh, they're putting on over here at the family room. And so we'll be able to kind of tag in that. We'll have a table uh, and some things outside. We're going to hopefully get some plans for maybe some balloons handouts, little things that we can do to bring awareness uh, to the fact that we're here, uh, that we're in our new spot, and I'm uh, very thankful for that opportunity. We will need volunteers that day, so if that's something that you would like to help out with, please let us know. And then, uh, coming up probably equally as fast in July, and I believe we decided on the 2nd for the movie, yep. July 2nd, um, we're going to do a movie called Faith of Our Fathers. Now, if you haven't seen this movie, you don't know what it's about, go out to our website, click on Grace Street Cinema. There's a little uh, synopsis of what the movie is about, plus the trailer of the movie. But ultimately, it's about uh, two soldiers from the Vietnam War who uh, their sons meet many, and like a quarter century later. They never knew each other. It was just, they just happened to meet and, and they're learning about the faith of their their fathers and, and what that looked like. So I invite you to join us for that. And one I forgot in here would be June 14th, which is Flag Day. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark and I will be out at Kirkwood and we will be hosting the flag burning ceremony, which is a part of the kickoff to Freedom Festival. It's something we've been doing for a few years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, gotta remember sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> and, not, and then you have to kind of move around the, the, the fire because the smoke gets to billowing and, and uh, can make it a little hard to read or read, breathe. Year 12 for this. Year 12, wow. Wow. Been doing that for quite some time. So, um, it's also honoring our fallen veterans. So. Yes, we do read off the names of the veterans who have uh, passed over the past year. Which last year was a little difficult for me because I knew a few of the guys. So. Well, with that, with our little bit different format where uh, music is being at the end, we're going to go into our call to worship. And this morning, for our call to worship, uh, Pastor Mark has chosen 1 Corinthians 1 18 through 20. And this section is actually in my Bible it's titled The Wisdom of God. It says this, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. That's a lot in there. And I'm certainly not going to be able to unpack it all in, in a timely manner. So let's just talk about it just a little bit. So according to the Bible, there were two types of responses to the gospel. One, you were headed for destruction, and the other one, you were being saved. And that's pretty much the message of the church. That's the message of this church. We are, uh, I've said this before, we're travel agents, but we only have one destination. Um, and so when I think about those responses, I was led to Luke 2, and this is where Simeon blessed uh, Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And he said this, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. 
he's prophesying this very same thing that Paul is talking about here. And then in Romans uh, 9, 10, and 12, Paul's talking about their ancestor Isaac and when he was born and how God had already told his mother that the younger son would rule over the older son, that there was an order and God design, God has a purpose for our lives. And this truth does not make God responsible for those who don't choose him. That's, that's our decision. He gave us free will. They perish because they of their own sin and because they're stubborn. Let's just face it, they're stubborn. Mm -hmm. Those who believe are saved. On the other hand, those uh, and are those who are called. So 1 Corinthians 1 24 says, But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, I love that fact that Paul writes, says, Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And when he's talking about the philosopher, the scholar, and the debater, it's not clear whether Paul intends a, a sharp distinction between them, but his, his theology is built on the basic opposition between the present evil age, or the world, and what is to come when Jesus returns. And so as Mark gets into today, and, and we start talking about anthropology and the uh, who is man, think about this. Philippians 3.20 says, <coughs> We are citizens of heaven. Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly, eagerly waiting for Him to return as our Savior. So, Father God, as we prepare to hear the message that You have given to Mark this morning, we just, as we do every week, we pray for open hearts and open minds to hear this message, to to learn from it, and Father, to take the the teachings and be able to use them in our daily lives. Help us as we go through this entire series, Father, to better understand what it is that you have for us and what you want us to do, how we can help fulfill your calling on our, each of our lives, regardless of what that is. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing today? Awesome. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, it's bright and sunny outside today. It, uh, it, it is uh, oh, uh, an awakening. We're actually having spring. Because <laughs> we kind of went from winter, jumped into summer. Then we kind of went back to winter a little bit there. And now we're actually finally getting spring. And it really feels nice. <laughs> and it really does. But, uh, you know, I wanted to open this morning and I wanted to call upon the Holy Spirit to, to come into our hearts and come into our minds today as we prepare our hearts to receive the message that God has for us. So today, surrender your life to Him and trust Him. Draw on the power of the Holy Spirit today to guide you through your day. So let's pray this prayer in unison in one spirit. Father, Thank you that I can depend on you. Empower my life with the Holy Spirit. Help me to trust in you fully and to let your Spirit guide my heart. Bring your Holy Spirit to us today. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and they shall be created and you will renew the face of the earth. Lord, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful. And in that same spirit, help us to delight in what is right and always rejoice in your consolation. And we ask this through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So today we're, we're going to learn about anthropology. And it's kind of funny because most of the people get anthropology and archaeology mixed up. But anthropology is the study of man, and archaeology is the study of fossils, bones, and those kind of things. So I wanted to make that distinction, so we're not going to talk about dinosaurs today. But, which is kind of unfortunate, because I really like dinosaurs. But who is man? Uh, we, we really want to find out who man is. And in the call to worship today, I, I thought this really drove the point home. Um... Uh, 
because there's such a distinction, and we, we talked about that in the philosophy segment that we had. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. Those who don't believe in the cross, they don't believe in what happened on that cross. Well, they're headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it's the very power of God. You know, let that settle into your hearts a little bit. And I want that to kind of flavor the message for today. The scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So what God is saying is, don't put your intelligence and your knowledge base above me. Some people make that into their own God. And, you know, there are certain philosophies that go through and tell us that you are your own God. And it's these kind of uh, intellectuals out here and, and a lot of the academics that follow that sense of reasoning through. And so it determines that they, there's a division between who man is, several different types of division. So it goes on to say, where does this lead those philosophers, the scholars, the world's brilliant debaters? Well, God has made the wisdom of this world foolish. Made it to look foolish. So anthropology, the study of humans. Today we're going to study on, on two things in, in general today. The problem of evil and who is man. So in our study on Wednesday night, one of the big questions that they ask everybody is, you know, how do you define evil? And nobody had a good answer answer. But there's several different ways to see evil. And evil can take several different forms. So we need to understand this. And one of the great definitions that I thought was, uh, it says that evil is doing something very bad, terrible, and feeling really good about it. That's evil. A total lack of moral <laughs> Uh, sensibilities, a total lack of remorse for those actions that they've taken, taking delight in the misery and misfortune of others, and a total disregard for your fellow man. Now that is evil. So I came up with those definitions as I was writing this out, and it's kind of funny, because the more I wrote, the more I'd come back up and I'd add another one, and then I'd add another one, and I'd add another one. Because as you think about it, there's a lot of different evil and a lot of different forms of evil in the world today. It may be hard to define evil, especially if you have no moral basis. But evil comes in many forms. It comes down to man's inhumanity against man. So I have a co-worker in Des Moines who's been struggling with her health for several years. And for the last two years, she has been treated for many, many different symptoms, including narcolepsy. Finally, she was referred into a specialist and they ran uh, blood panels and tox screens. And what came back was she was being poisoned. So they went and tested various products around and found that poison was in one of the drinks. And her boyfriend had been giving her low doses of poison and poisoning her. Now it was done as a form of control to keep her under control, but you know, also she came into a large amount of money, and so I think he was it was a way for him to try and get at the money. But if we think about that, her boyfriend, who was living with her at the time, was poisoning her as we go. Evil right in her very home evil. What would drive a person to do that to another person that you supposedly love, that you supposedly care about, that you're sharing your life with? Evil. Can you imagine what kind of effects that's going to have on her for the rest of her life? How would you ever have the ability to trust another? evil. Why? Why? Why do we have such evil in this world? Well, I submit that 
Because Satan is really good at what he does. That's why. So look how he snuck things into our culture and how they're actually accepted as behavior that's acceptable. Okay? I think back to the horror movies that are so violent and graphic, they would have been banned a few short years ago. We wouldn't have been able to even show them because they show such graphic and, and just horrible things on there. And yet people go, oh, can't wait till the, can't, can't wait till the next one comes out. First person shooter games that have distorted reality and changed the views of murdering another person. It's a dumbing down of the senses and this term, they have a term for it, it's called anamorphosis. Or to distort the picture to fit a certain purpose. So it's been actually used in photography for many, many years. They, they actually distort it so they can bring focus onto something to give it purpose. So this is what's happening in our society today. We are being anamorphosized to dumb ourselves down to the reaction to murders, to graphic horror, to shooting other persons. And, and you kind of wonder why they have this false sense, they have a distorted sense of human life and what it's worth. And so we get all these mass shootings. I mean, we had six, six of them, and I didn't get the stats from Chicago from last night, but we had six sh shootings mass shootings this week alone. Something's wrong with society. Mm -hmm. Satan's doing a really good job mm -hmm. at what he does. Well, one of the other things that uh, I wanted to bring out is, you know, we, we, seem to, we seem to go through as a culture and as a society today, and we desensitize ourselves to evil. And we change our moral viewpoints. Abortion is another example. Taking a life, no matter how you frame it, no matter what excuse you use, is still murder. You're still taking another life. And I, I think uh, people claim this, you know, as, as a human right to be able to do this, to take the life of another. We've desensitized ourselves to evil so much as a society today, this is why the world is in the shape that it's in. We have removed God and we've replaced it with these other common forms of evil. And as we as a society have been anamorphized on practically every moral front, we as Christians have been demonized by those simply not agreeing. We don't agree with their distorted point or view of what's actually right in the world. So where does that leave us? Who are we as a people? See, I could go on with this topic for hours at a time because there's so much wrong in our society today. There's so much evil in our culture today. This is why we need a sound doctrine to stand our ground against evil in the world that we live in. So what is our primary doctrine? Who is man? Who is God? Well, as Terry said, next Wednesday night, we're going to be talking about theology, which goes hand in hand with the anthropology. Who is man and who is God? The answers to these two questions form the foundation of everybody's worldview, whether it's a biblical worldview or whether it's a secular worldview. And I guess the best way to describe this is, Either you are with God or you are without God. As I said earlier today, some philosophies out there say you are your own God. So you go your own way. You do whatever you feel like doing. And, and there are no moral restrictions on you because there is no right. There is no wrong. It's just your cosmic dust in a box. You're the goo. You came from goo. And so there is no God in your life. So therefore, who's to tell you what's right and what's wrong? But see, it all starts with, we have to make a choice. In a world with God, we are blessed with some foundations on which we base our be behaviors and our thought patterns, and our character is developed from that. It means that we admit we need 
God in our lives. We know that fundamentally that we need to have God in our lives. We know we have the need to be redeemed because we are sinners. And we know we need the redemption of a loving God. And that God made the way for us to be saved. But it doesn't mean that we're going to be without conflict. It just means that we have a way to be saved. And that takes us back to that call to worship. Those who don't believe in God are doomed for destruction. And yet God made a way for us to be saved, redeemed, salvation through Christ Jesus. And see, that lays that foundation of that cosmic battle that we have within. Galatians 5, 16 and 17 say, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. See, that sinful nature makes us want to sin, makes us want to do things against the will of God, impose our will upon the will of God. And see, by doing that and having that kind of mindset, we put God inside a box and we limit his abilities to work within our lives by what we understand our abilities to be. And so we, uh, we superimpose our will upon God's will. And we have that desire of the Spirit, the Spirit of God living within us. Once we have Christ in our hearts, he sends that spirit of holiness to live within us. And I always love that mm -hmm. devil and angel kind of Im visual image, if you will. And, you know, one's talking to you about doing one thing, one's talking to you about other. But that is that cosmic battle. We have the Spirit of God talking to us, and we have the spirit of flesh, Satan, trying to talk us into doing something against the will of God. And it's usually the difference between good and evil. Right and wrong. See, for those of us who have a moral basis, those who have a belief in God, we stand apart from the world. Because God has put that sensibility of right and wrong in our hearts. He has brought that spirit of holiness within us. To face the evil that exists in the world. Our sinful nature is in conflict with God's spirit. It comes down to what is the Lord of your life. Our major problem is that Satan has made evil exciting. And if we look at it in this light, it could be said that evil is anyone or anything that would supplant God in your life. This conflict is what causes young Christians to be led astray. And even seasoned Christians may struggle this with us as well. But see, as a seasoned Christian, we have that basis, that foundation. And we're less prone then to readily fall away as someone who does not have that foundation in their hearts. In essence, this is the state of man today. Either you take the narrow path that leads to everlasting life, or you take that highway to hell. It's wide, and it's paved with temptations. The choice is yours. Really, the choice is yours. Romans 6, 12 through 14 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not Present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought bought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. We were bought by the grace of God. He paid a price for our sinful nature. He paid a price for our sin on the cross when he gave his only son. Sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but you are under the grace of God. Your sinful nature has been bought with a price. 
and the price was the life of Christ on the cross. Even when we choose to follow God, we can be distressed by that inability to control our actions. If we consider the struggles that the disciples face, even walking with Jesus daily, they argued amongst themselves, who is, who is greater? Because that was of the world. You wanted to have that position. In that society in that day, the higher you up you were in that position, the better off you were. So the disciples walked with Jesus every day. And they came and said, Jesus, who, who's the greatest among us in here? They were thinking like the world thinks. And Jesus had to bring them back down. So it's not hard for us to understand how we might struggle. We don't have Jesus walking right behind or by, by our sides, hanging onto our hands. Literally. But if we have Jesus in our hearts. He's already there no matter what. So if so we listen to the words of Paul, he tells us about his struggles. And if we think about Paul and his life and where he started out, he was a persecutor of Christians, even to death. And then he would stop dead cold in his tracks. This voice came down from heaven and said, Paul, why do you persecute? And he fell into blindness for three days. Three days. There always seems to be that three-day time. Frame. <laughs> and then what happened? Jesus lifted that blindness off of him. It changed him. It transformed him. It transfigured him. Sounds like the Easter story all over again, doesn't it? But that's what he does. He transforms us out of our sinful nature, out of the laws of man, out of the societal norms that tend to take over our lives. He transports us into a holiness through him. And he changed his name from Saul to Paul because he was a different person. Completely changed. Completely transformed. Paul says, for I do not understand my own actions for I do what I do not want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, then I agree with the law that it is good. So it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. Now, first off, if you read this kind of fast, You'll think you're in the middle of one of the Abbott and Costello things, you know, <laughs> who's on first. Yeah. But really, truly, if you stop and read it purposefully, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And that is a struggle that we, we have to live with each and every day. I don't care who you are. I, I struggle with this. I do the things I do not want to do, and I know I shouldn't be doing, but I do them anyway. Because... Unfortunately, I still have that sinful nature. I am saved by the grace of God. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. But I still struggle with that human, humanness, that human nature, and that sin that dwells within us. Good news comes in a little while. Wow. Well, that pretty much describes the struggles we face in our own hearts and our minds. But why? Why, if we choose to give our lives to God, should we be made to struggle? Well, it comes back to that human nature and that fallen state. We have been separated from God, and as we progress with God in our lives, we are being transformed from who we were to who God intends for us to be. And again, we need to look at what we make as the Lord of our lives.
Uh, what do we spend our time on, our talents and our resources? Is it to bring glory to God? Or is it for carnal desires? Those things that are self-serving and self-gratifying. Well, a lot of us find a lot of satisfaction in doing the things that we ought not to do because Satan has made those easy. They, he's made them exciting. It's kind of fun to do those things. And it's absolutely against the will of God. Ooh, there's that sinful nature coming back in. So we struggle with those things. We read on in Romans 8, 5 through 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, and indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Wow. That takes us right back to where we started off with our call to worship today. Doesn't it? We call this man's essence. Who we are. Who we are at our very core man's essence let's take a look at that first of all we're made in god's image for a christian now that means something out there it means something for us and if we think back to the to genesis 3 and we're, we're looking at that in genesis 3 it tells us about the essence of who god made us to be at that point in time we were perfect and we lived in a perfect world without sin without sin we were made in the very essence of god who we are at the very core now if you're of the world and buy into the philosophies of the world there is no god so you were made by a series of happenings not of which had any form or structure or design we're just made up of that primordial ooze, that goo that was out there. And if you buy into that, you need to do your research. Intelligent design cannot come from chaos. That is a scientific fact. So even the arguments of those who oppose a godly worldview don't stand up. You can't have intelligent design come from chaos, from nothing. It can't happen. It's scientifically impossible. In a world where God does not exist, there is no basis for right and wrong. And in that world, evil can flourish. I hold that those who hold that opinion have never faced pure evil that exists in the world. Those who have no basis for God in their lives, that we came from that primordial, they've never faced pure evil as it exists. Most say that man's inherently good, and so therefore it's all things from outside that make the difference. It's all those outside influences that made somebody be evil. Really, where does evil come from then? If man's inherently good, he has no sinful nature, where does this stuff that influenced him come from? In our godly worldview, we can answer those questions easily. It is because of our fallen nature. That means if we are changed, born again, then we must have differences in the state of our spirits and in our souls, our very being, the very core of our essence. Our study tells us that there are several states of man. Man was born innocent, Genesis 1, So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. So if we were created in the image of God who is perfect, then we were created us perfect as well. Meaning that we were born pure in spirit. Pure in spirit. So if we were pure in spirit, there was no sin within us at that point in time. God created a perfect world for us to live in, and he created us without sin. No evil intents 
or desires. Now, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great to have a world like that? Why would you ever want it to change? All we had to do is follow a simple few rules and it was all good. Period. End of the story. Almost. But see, Satan wanted God's new creation for his own. It's obvious he didn't have the power to create life, so he took it instead. Literally, he took life instead. And he did this through deception and trickery. So he tempted Eve and Adam with deceptive talk and a lie. He created and corrupted God's perfect creation. Man was fallen. Fallen prey to pure evil. Evil was introduced into the world that God created. So as such, our second state that we are in is we are fallen. The serpent was the shrewdest of all wild animals in the Lord that, that the Lord God had made one day. He asked the woman, did, did God really say that you must not eat of the tree, of any of the trees in the fruit of the garden? She said, of course. We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat of it or touch of it. If you do, you will die. The servant goes, ah, you won't die. You won't die. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So we became fallen. Mm -hmm. You know the rest of the story, Genesis 3, 1 through 4. Mm -hmm. Ate the apple, listened to the woman. <laughs> in this state, in this fallen state, you will die. There is no salvation. Mm -hmm. There is no hope. Mm -hmm. It is void of goodness. See, in, in the Bible, it tells us also that hell is the place for the soul of extreme torment by being separated by the blessings of God for all eternity. Revelations 21.8. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt murderers, the immoral, who practice witchcraft, idol worshiper, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Our first death was separation from God in the Garden of Eden. We are fallen by our very state. But see, we, we serve a loving God. He created us. He loves us from the very beginning before we were made from dirt. He created us out of love. So in this fallen state, we have no choice but death, but he brought us away to be redeemed. And that's our third state, redeemed. God recognized that not all humans were inherently bad. And he set forth a plan to redeem mankind and to bring them back into a right relationship with him. If we think back and we read that story of Noah in there, and we, we listen to what it says. God looked at the earth and he looked at the humans and he looked at all the evil that was going on in the world. And he says, I got to wipe these guys out. I got to start over. But he saw the heart of Noah and it was good and he was faithful. And so he set forth a plan at that point in time to redeem mankind. To redeem mankind started that path going forward and from Noah on out it's a story of how God's love is redeeming us through all the different things that he tried until he sent his son Jesus which brings us to John 3 16 and 17 for this is how God loved the world he came as one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life 
For God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Redeemed. Redemption. Salvation. He brought hope into a hopeless situation. He brought us back into a way to have his spirit within us. That right relationship. Righteousness. That's what that word means. Is a right relationship with God. So now. Now within this redeemed state we have the ability to be glorified. Now we need to understand that our physical bodies will all pass away at some point in time. We will die a physical death here on earth. But our heavenly body will live on in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15.42 says, It is the same way with the resurrection of our dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. They will be raised to live forever. So we as Christians, we as the people who believe in Christ and what he's done for us. We have a path to glory. We'll be glorified through our faith in Jesus, through our belief. But remember what I said about the hell, the souls of those who are separated from God at death? They will be sent to hell to extreme torture. But those who are in Christ will be saved through him. So man has a dualistic or a monistic point of view that he he has. So those of us who are Christians, we, we have the ability to have a dualistic point of view, which means we are of the flesh and of the spirit as well, dwelling within us. Those who are without God, remember when I started the whole thing off today, I said we have one point of view, either we're with God or we are without God. Those who are without God have a monistic point of view. There is no God. We're just products of goo. Both flesh and spirit are just purely material. If we look at the world view, it says we're made of goo, cosmic materials, just one stuff, and that's all there is. Monistic. When we die, that's it. Just dead. Worm fodder. It's all over. <laughs> Period. That's it. And this is a naturalistic philosophy. If a person were to die in this state, they would go to hell. No hope. Just hell. That's it. You have no hope. You have no salvation. You had nothing. You die. Period. You're done. But those who believe in a godly worldview are dualistic. There is more to us than just a physical body. We have a soul. And with our faith in Jesus, we are reconciled to God, brought back from death into new life. Not just here on earth, but when we die, we will be raised. Our spirit, our soul will live on with God and Jesus in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? amen. We will be fully restored, not just physical restoration, but we will be raised spiritually to heaven. We have purpose. We have hope. We have free will to determine our outcome. We have a choice. And we have belonging as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have hope in that. If we contrast this with the naturalistic philosophy of location, no God, no purposeful forces, no foundations for ethics, no free will, no life after death, no meaning in life, no purpose for why we simply exist. We're just here. We're stuff in the box. Sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah. See, if you buy into this world view, this world of, or this view of life, why even try? Just do or die. This is why and where some feel that they are so despondent, they take their own life. See, because they have nothing to live for. Mm -hmm. Nothing. No future. Nothing. Mm -hmm. It's a very dangerous mindset to have. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to man's moral state and man's means. And uh, 
it's kind of funny in the study we were going back through and it, it just took me right back to college and you know that was a long time ago back in the 70s uh, abraham maslow in his hierarchy of needs man's ultimate objective is self-actualization there's several simple steps that will help you embark on that path of self-actualization conscious and complete experience of all the events that occur on the path of life so I'm taken back to a movie Ter Terry likes songs and, and movies and stuff so I'm gonna take you back to a movie right now the character's name is Carl the groundskeeper on my deathbed I will receive total consciousness so I got that going for me that's what that's about so on my deathbed, I'll receive total consciousness. And uh, guess what? It's too late. It's too late by then. The realization that each person has the right to choose the use of this feature to achieve their own goals. Remember, there's no right or wrong. So whoever you have to hurt to get what you want, it's okay. Because... They were holding you back from what you wanted. There's no moral rights. There's no moral wrongs. There's nothing. Change of attitude towards responsibility. I am only responsible for me. That's it. The uh, formation of the ability, the pernicious life, getting in touch with your inner nature. Well, if your inner nature is sinful to start with, you have no sense of right or wrong because they don't <coughs> exist in this mindset. Whatever goes, goes. Well, then he follows it up with, we're basically good or we're basically sinful. One of the two. So what's true? What is false? Depends on your reality at the time. That leaves us with a total lack of moral compass. It breeds a lack of centering for life. No established laws of nature apply. Free to be. Whatever makes you happy. Free to be whatever makes you happy. New social more self-identification. What does that do? Leads to the depravity of man. Man's propensity for evil. You want to know where evil comes from? Carl Rogers says, I do not find that evil is inherent in human nature. Hmm. So, all humans are basically good, perfect, right? There's no evil in their nature, there's no sinful basis. So, where does evil come from, Carl? On his death, he'll have total spiritual truth to put to death your earthly nature romans 8 13 and colossians 3 5 and 10. if evil is not inherent in man then where does evil come from well go back to abraham maslow again sick people are made by a sick culture so i say a sick culture is made by what that's all good so what made the sick culture culture is the actions and activities of man as they define it he himself defines so what created the sick culture well lack of moral structure there you go there's your answer abraham carl rogers says experience leads me to believe that is cultural influences which are the major factor in our evil behaviors cultural influences based on a lack of moral restraint no right no wrong then all is good lack of moral restraint so here's what the big one is our social institutions and authority structures are blamed for man's evils actions it provides the basis for understanding the battleground over social institutions today social institutions such as the church we're to blame because we brought evil into the world how do we do that if 
there is no God. So the church is to blame because they imposed their will upon people. We're too restrictive. We're not all inclusive. It's not a utopian worldview where there is no right, no wrong. Everyone just gets along. See, a utopia, as Plato envisioned it and imagined it, represented an unobtainable, perfect society or community in which social, economic, environmental, and scientific conditions were absolutely ideal. And it typically describes an imagery of a community or society that possesses highly desirable or nearly perfect qualities for its members. I like, I like that definition because the first two things is Plato imagined it represented an unobtainable perfect society or community. He thought it was out there, but it is totally un unobtainable. We can never get there. Well, why can't we get there, Mr. Philosopher? Because man is inherently evil, sinful by nature. So therefore, we can't get there. He, see, he sees that picture. And if you think about it, utopia sounds like a great place to be, right? Kind of sounds like heaven, doesn't it? Yeah. But without all the religious mumbo jumbo, it sounds like they want to get to heaven without Jesus. Yeah, Problem is, no one's perfect except Jesus. That's why it's unattainable and unobtainable. So their fourth point is, why should evil bother someone with a secular worldview? And the question of evil is more difficult for them than it is for us, because they have no basis of judgment to determine what evil is. Everybody's just good. There is no right, there is no wrong. Everybody just gets along. It doesn't work. God, that he loved us so much that he made a way for us to be reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. We can live outside of that worldview while living in the world through Jesus. We need to be steadfast in our faith, in our convictions, in our love for God. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for the victory and power in your name. Thank you that you hold the keys over death and that by your might, Jesus was raised from the grave, paving the way for us to have new life with you. Thank you that you had a plan for us and that you made a way for us to join you in eternity. We confess our need for you today to refresh us and make us new again. We ask that you would renew our hearts and our minds and our lives for the days ahead. We pray for your redemption for us. Keep your words of truth planted firm within us and help us to keep focused on what is pure and right. Give us the power to be obedient to your word. And when the enemy reminds us where we've been, sending his lies and attacks our ways, we trust that your voice speaks louder and stronger, reminding us that we are safe with you and that your purposes and plans for us will not fail. We ask that you would be our defense and our guard, keeping our way clear, removing the obstacles and covering the pitfalls. Lord, lead us on your level ground. Shine your light in us, through us and over us to be a light to our world. May we make a difference in this world for your glory. Set forth your way before us. May all your plans succeed. May we reflect your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence and your healing. Thanks be to you, God, for your indescribable gift of your Son, Jesus. To you be glory and honor this day.
come to this time of communion. This morning I was kind of pulled back to the moment just be, or the moments just before that last supper, in which Jesus takes off his cloak, wraps an apron around his waist, and washes the disciples' feet. And it's interesting that he would choose to wash the disciples' feet, even though one of them is about to betray him. And that is a reminder that as we go through this world, and, and in, not in the same exact words, but Mark talked about this morning, we tarnish that relationship. We tarnish it. But here's the thing. Our relationship is secure. We may stumble and fall, but our relationship is secure. He offers us that grace, that mercy, that forgiveness, and that love. But we tend to forget to offer to others. Peter got mad at Jesus, saying, well, if you're going to wash my feet, just wash my whole body. He didn't get it. He wasn't getting it. The person, they, the feet were dirty, not the rest of them. And it goes to that point where our relationship might, we may tarnish it a little bit, but we still have that relationship. So as we take communion today, we are able to rest assured that that relationship is strong. And this is a reminder as we do each week that Jesus died for our sins. Now he, he, he takes this position, not of, of just him, you know, Jesus coming as man to wash the disciples' feet. It goes even lower than that. So it's the next to the lowest servant who removes the sandal, and it's the lowest servant. The lowest person on the, on, on the, the ring, or on the, on the, if you put it everything on a ladder, the lowest one. Right? He takes that position provides us with an example on how we can come and love others. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. And then a little later in the meal, he filled the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my cup, or my blood poured out for the sins of many. Take and drink. We're reminded by scripture that this is not just something we do every week. This is something we do in remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice for us. <coughs> and the body of Christ broken for you. Take. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Take. Father, we thank you for what this meal represents. We ask that you would help us to follow Jesus' example, not just in the words, but also through our actions. And Father, this is a celebration. And we thank you for all that you have given us and all that we have to celebrate. In Jesus' name. prayers for my daughter and her mom's side of the family. My ex-wife had a massive stroke yesterday and was removed from uh, life support shortly thereafter and passed. Sorry to hear. So just prayers for peace and comfort for the family. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else this morning? Please remember all of that family for the 
victims that lost their lives in mass shootings this week. I think yes. we should remember them. Yes, absolutely. Pray for them. Pray for them. Okay. Well, this morning, um, before I start, um, I just want to share a few words from a song that's been playing in my head all night long. And it's called um, Known by Torn Wells. So if you have time today, look it up and listen to it. Um, it's just a really wonderful song. And um, the words are something like this. I'm fully known and loved by you. You won't let go no matter what I do. You guard my heart with your truth, the kind of love that's bulletproof. It's hard truth and ridiculous grace to be fully known and loved by you. <coughs> and God's love is forever, and we're just grateful for that. But we have to do our part and accept him into our lives and read his word. And I believe that as humans, we like to live in the past, but as Christians, God gives us the gift of the present and hope for the future. In Psalms 91, uh, 1 and 2, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So this morning, Father God, we'd like to lift up all those people of the ones that were shot this week, all the families, Lord Jesus. Our hearts go out to them, Father God, for there's such a sudden, sudden death to the ones that they love. There is no rhyme or reason, just evil in this world that likes to take over and hurt other people. So we pray that these families will reach out to you, Father God, and their eyes and their hearts and their ears will be open towards you, Father God, and they will find a personal relationship with you to give them hope for the future to come. And Father God, I'd like to lift up Amanda and her um, mom's family, um, stepfather, and, and just all who are in this family, Lord God. We know you are God and you have a purpose and plan for our lives. There are times when we can't see those plans and our loved ones are taken away suddenly. Father God, I ask that you surround this family with your loving, with your amazing love and grace. Comfort them as only you can, Father God. Give them rest and peace as you help them through this time in their lives. Walk with them and surround them with your Holy Spirit. Guide them each and every day, giving them peace in their hearts and minds. For you are the great comforter, Lord God. You are their protector, and we ask this in Jesus' holy name for all that's involved in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Denise. Um, as we uh, prepare to close out our online portion of our service today, um, I invite you to take a look. We're, we're going to have a couple new songs that we've never had before here that we haven't shown. Um, but I want to remind you that, and our, our depiction here today is that we're at a crossroads, and we have a choice to make in our lives, yes. and we need to make sure that we choose <clears throat> the right direction to go, <clears throat> literally, the right direction to go. If we choose the path that leads to life and life thereafter, then we don't have to worry about the junk in the world. Our future is already in the hands of God. Amen. If you choose the wrong path, your future is in the hands of Satan. Mm -hmm. Make sure you choose correctly. Amen. Our benediction today, Lord, we we come before you. We submit ourselves wholly and totally to you. We pray for our world today. And we ask God for you to grant. To the living grace to the departed rest to our nation peace and harmony to us all God grant to us your servants the promise of that everlasting life the light to guide us on our way courage to support each other in 
grace and in mercy. Lord, we ask that your blessing on us to unite us in service to you, our God, and to our church. Let us go forth into the world in peace, hope, and love, wholly dedicated to your service, O Lord. Let us hold fast to that which is good, strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak, help the needy and the afflicted, and honor all people. Help us to love and serve you today, Lord rejoicing in the power of your spirit within us. And may God's blessing be upon us and remain with us always. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray today. Amen. Amen. Amen.